good afternoon and welcome to this new event, which is the third contribution of the Observatorio de la Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas en los Estados Unidos to Harvard's Worldwide Week, a week composed of events with an international component organized by different units with a global mission at Harvard University. We wanted to contribute to this particular session uh, not just because the international component is clear in the fascinating journey that the uh, Garcia family began between, the Sp between Spain and the US, but also because we thought it was important to highlight the crucial role that that Spanish family of artists and, and, uh, and singers played in the introduction and dissemination of the European uh, opera repertoire in this country. We are very honored, moreover, to have put together a panel of experts who also make, make up an international group, but who more importantly are all highly acclaimed musicologists or performers. Professors Walter Clark, Patricia Kleinman, Molly Nelson Haber, and performers, artists, Anna Tonna and Isabel Perez Dobarro. I am deeply grateful to pianist Isabel Perez Dobarro for first suggesting this session to the Observatorio and then for organizing the panel. This is actually the second event we have held in collaboration with Isabel. The first one was about Joaquin Rodrigo in the United States. And both sessions are excellent examples of the place that music must have in the program of a research center like this, the Instituto of Cervantes at Harvard University, which is devoted to studying and furthering the knowledge of the contribution of Hispanic cultures, uh, and within uh, them music, of course, in the United States. The session will consist of a discussion moderated by Isabel Perez Tobarro with, with the four panelists, and it, the discussion will be punctuated by some audios in which we will uh, be able to enjoy music by the Garcia family. We will finish with a Q&A in which you will all be, be invited to <clears throat> ask questions or make comments in either English or Spanish. But let me briefly uh, introduce Isabel Perez Tobarro to you before the panel starts and she will be introducing the, the four panelists. Isabel uh, Perez Navarro is considered one of the most internationally renowned Spanish pianists. She was recently named Woman to Follow in Culture 2021, and she was a finalist at the Future Classic Women Award in London. She has developed her concert career in the United States, Spain, Russia, Belgium, Argentina, Italy, Portugal, performing at impo really important venues like Carnegie Hall, or Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, the Tchaikovsky Conservatory in Moscow, very, very relevant places in Spain like the Fundación Juan Mart, Palau de la Musica Catalana, etc. She has played with important orchestras from Spain and she has uh, participated in important international music festivals. Isabel has organized and participated in a, in a tribute to composer Pauline Viardot, one of Manuel Garcia's uh, uh, daughters, uh, on the occasion of her, of her bicentenary, <clears throat> and as a result, she released the, uh, the CD, The Unknown Pauline Viardot, Chamber Songs and Duets, which received the Melomano de Oro Award and the five stars by Ritmo Magazine. Isabel also has a, a, a facet as a, as, a, um, as a researcher. She actually has a PhD from New York University and has given master classes and lectures in, in important cultural institutions and musical institutions in, in, in the US and, and along Europe. And she's now working on a book on Spanish women composers, which I think I've read it will be presented soon. So thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much for suggesting this very special event. And uh, so you have the floor now. Thank you so much, Marta, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you to Observatorio Cervantes at Harvard University. We're really honored and really happy to be part of the programming of this great institution. 
and to highlight a very interesting family, the Garcias family. Now, we will embark in a journey that will take us to the 1820s. We're going to discover this family of extraordinary artists who truly changed the history of the American music scene. We'll explore this family's lasting impact, which is still present today. And we also have prepared some very special surprises, indeed, some world premiere recordings we'll here for the very first time today. So a lot of things that are happening in this panel, and I'm really, really excited to be joined by these esteemed panelists. First of all, Professor Walter Aaron Clark, who's a professor at the University of Riverside in California. He uh, previously taught at the University of Kansas for 10 years, and also at Scripps and Pomona Colleges in California State University at Long Beach and UCLA. He's also a collaborating professor and the doctoral faculties in musicology at three universities in Spain, Valladolid, La Rioja, and the Complutense. He has received several awards, the Lama Foundation Award, also King Felipe from Spain gave him and conferred on him the title of Comendador de la Orden de Isabel la Católica. And he's one of the greatest experts in Spanish music and Spanish musicians. So we are really happy to come with him today. Thank you so much for joining Walter. Thank you also to Molly Nelson Haber, who is an independent scholar based in New York City. Her latest essay appears in Italian opera in the United States, 1800 to 1850. So her topic of expertise is precisely these years in which the opera, the Italian opera, developed in the United States. She's currently completing a corrective biography of Maria Maliran, one of the main characters of the story of the Garcia family, based on trolls of her previously unknown letters. So we're going to learn a lot about what happened in those years here in the United States and also about this extraordinary family. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Also, we have Patricia Kleiman, musicologist. Patricia Kleiman is the founder and director of the Initiative Proyecto Compositoras, an organization dedicated to the recuperation and performance of unpublished works by women composers. We'll see how the women in the Garcia family were truly extraordinary and they became examples for other generations of women in music. So a very important work, Patricia Kleiman is precisely making sure that these works are known, that these works are performed. She's a member of the Spanish Society of Musicology where she was part of the commissions of studies in gender of women and music and music in American studies. And she was part of this CD that Marta was uh, telling before this, the unknown Pauline Biardo, this research on Pauline Biardo, one of the key members of the Garcia family. So thank you so much for joining, Patricia. Thank you for having me. And also we have- sorry, sorry to interrupt. We hear you with some interference. Maybe if you withdraw yourself a little bit from the screen, yes. it'll be clearer. I get, is this better? Maybe. Let's just okay. try. Let's just try. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Mm. Sorry for that. Um, and we also have Anna Donna. Anna Donna, a mezzo-soprano and independent investigator, focused on the vocal repertoire from the Hispanic world. She has worked in both performance projects and investigations with the Hispanic Society of America and the Iberian Music Center at CUNY and as a Fulbright Scholar with the Fundación Juan Marc. Her recent collaborations were also involved in this Pauline Biardot project, including the edition of um, Biardot's Spanish songs, and French songs for Hildegard Publishing and Clarnan Editions. And she's also a great expert in Rosini. In fact, she released this city, España la Rosini, highlighting these connections between Spain and the great opera of so thank you so much for joining us. So now we're going to travel. We're going to start this fascinating journey. And we're going to go back in time to November 29th, 1825. An extraordinary event took place then. The premiere of Il Barbieri di Semiglia in New York's Art Theater a performance that would forever change the course of the vocal music history in America, the arrival of the Italian opera to the United States. So, so Molly, please, could you take us to that night? 
and describe us what happened. I would be delighted to take you back to that moment in time. By eight o'clock on that historic evening of November 29, 1825, the most fashionable audience in memory had filled every seat in the city's elegant park theater. New York's cultural elite were about to witness the first production in America of an opera sung entirely in Italian. That opera was to be Rossini's comic masterpiece, Il Barbiera de Sevilla. Featuring the composer's first alma viva, the legendary Spanish tenor Manuel Garcia, supported by members of his own family. Few in the audience knew precisely how this magical moment had materialized, but most knew who had brought it to fruition. For weeks, the city's music starved populace had been set abuzz over Lynch's opera troupe. And now Lynch was right there in the Park Theater audience, his eyes fixed on the park's scarlet curtain, about to rise on a night scene in Seville. Everyone in town knew Dominic Lynch, son of wealthy, cultured Irish emigres, widower and father of five, yet forever a trendsetter, an arts patron, patron, amateur musician, crooner of Moore's Irish melodies to his own piano accompaniments, to the endearment of his many friends, and most importantly, the master spirit behind New York's fledgling Philharmonic Society. But New Yorkers' votary of music, as James Fenimore Cooper pronounced Lynch, had been noticeably and regrettably absent from their city for well over a year. Lynch had been in Paris, traveling abroad for the first time. Lynch was on a novel quest to speculate in futures of fine Bordeaux wine to be sold by subscription to an exclusive New York clientele. Lynch's constant companion in Paris was his expat childhood friend, Washington Irving, America's first man of letters. Irving introduced Lynch to the Italian opera on the Rue Louvois, currently showcasing the great Italian soprano, Giudita Pasta, then at the pinnacle of her powers. Her superb mastery of uh, her, sorry, her superb artistry awakened in Lynch a passion for Italian opera. Pasta's portrayal of the heroine in Paziello's Nina particularly entranced Lynch. From that evening forward, he resolved to find the means to transport genuine Italian opera to New York at whatever cost but not without Pasta herself. Lynch offered the diva a sum sufficiently generous to persuade her to request a leave of absence from the French government. She demurred, confessing a terror of ocean voyages. Lynch persisted, charming her with notes addressed to the Queen of Beaux-Arts. Pasta diplomatically suggested that Lynch instead seek out the incomparable Garcia family, as she described her friends in London, where Judita was impatiently waited. Judita would sing on stage opposite the father and on the concert platform with the 17-year-old daughter, Maria, a contralto whose precocious talent Judita genuinely worshiped. Meanwhile, Lynch wrote John Jacob Astor, co-owner of New York's Park Theater, to obtain approval to engage an opera troupe to perform Tuesday and Thursday, Saturday nights, replacing the regular dramatic corps. When Pasta returned to Paris, she advised Lynch to move quickly. The Garcias might go on to Mexico. Judita's husband and manager, Giuseppe, had succumbed, had remained in London. Having failed to launch his own singing career, he had succumbed to crippling self-loathing until energized by Lynch's opera project. Giuseppe began blitzing his wife with letters, pressuring her to reconsider going to New York, even threatening to go without her. Upon his arrival in London in June 1825, great news greeted Lynch. Maria Garcia had just debuted spectacularly at the Italian opera. A last-minute cancellation had the debutante, with no rehearsals whatsoever, rushed on stage to sing Rosina to her father's alma viva. Her triumph became the talk of the London social season. Lynch engaged all four Garcias and then added eight more singers and backstage artists to the troupe. 
after a flying trip to Paris to engage a soprano, having vainly pitched the project to Judita one last time, Lynch joined his opera company in Liverpool, England. The troupe, including Giuseppe Pasta, all alone and depressed as ever, boarded the packet ship New York on October 1st. They stepped ashore in Manhattan on November 7th. They would open in three weeks. Bravos, bravissimos, and peals of delight rang out long after the curtain fell on the Garcia Troops' transcendent open night performance. Initial public response to this bold and most costly experiment was unrestrainedly enthusiastic. Critics lavished praise upon Director General Garcia Sr., the cast members, the double orchestra. But the evening belonged to Maria Felicia Garcia as Rosina. The audience had never experienced such vocal and histrionic perfection in one so young. By dawn, she was the city's darling, fondly dubbed by press and public alike, the Signorina. That morning, Lynch wrote Judita Pasta of the premiere's complete success, graciously thanking her for the triumph of his vision and predicting that this little signorina would become the prima donna of Europe. And she truly became the prima donna of Europe and we will explore this later. First of all, let's contextualize this arrival of the Garcias within the presence of Spanish musicians and Spanish music at the time. So perhaps Walter, you can tell us more about this. So what was the presence of Spanish music, Spanish art, Spanish artists back in those decades? Well, I'll do my best. And I want to thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this uh, exciting an informative event. I know that I'm going to learn a lot. I just did from that excellent presentation. The other thing I should say is that uh, this is an impressive panel of experts. In the words of Carl Sagan, there are no authorities, only experts, and the experts can be wrong, but uh, these experts will not be. Um, all right, so uh, we get underway. I see that my slides are ready to rock there. Um, so one thing we tend to forget is that there is a long history of Hispanophilia in the US, uh, which reached a fever pitch in the early 1900s in the wake of the Spanish-American War. Americans now felt free to enjoy Spain as an exotic realm of romantic escapism, no longer fearing it as a colonial rival. It was in this context that the first Spanish opera premiered in the US, Granados' Goyescas at the Met in 1916, Granados also had a dread of uh, ocean voyages, the water in general, and he would die at sea with his wife on the return voyage to Spain. At the same time, New York audiences fell in love with Arzuela with a 1917 production of uh, La Tierra de la Alegría, uh, the land of joy with a score by Quinito Valverde, though it was billed as a revista, but it was essentially a Arzuela. And was very well received. Critics went wild uh, for the music and especially the dance numbers executed by the renowned La Argentina. Around this same time, the great Catalan guitarist Miguel Jobet was also performing in New York and providing Americans with a revelation of the Spanish guitar, a subject that now takes us back to the early 1800s, which I was initially invited to address. So let's look at that next slide. Now, Indeed, this post-war awakening did not come out of nowhere. There is an excellent book on this subject, by the way, by uh, Richard L. Kagan called uh, The uh, Spanish Craze, which was published in 2019. He details the cultural history of the US's love affair with Spain, which may have begun as early as the late 1700s. So to be clear, it did not begin with Garcia. This, it has deep roots in American culture going back at least as far as the 18th century. Thomas Jefferson wrote to a friend that among foreign languages, French was the most important for an American to acquire. But surprise, surprise, Spanish was next in importance. He actually learned Spanish himself and was an admirer of uh, Cervantes' Don Quixote. So this was something I actually did not know. And uh, yes. Now, it should come as no surprise, considering that vast tracts of what would one day be part of the United States were still part of Spain at that time. 
and the missions that the Spaniards established in California, for instance, uh, were repositories of sacred music, much of it by Spanish composers. I live about a half an hour from, from a Spanish mission. And it's, uh, these were, they are controversial cultural institutions, certainly considering the treatment of Native Americans, but they were important centers for music making and music education and composition and performance. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, as Louise Stein points out in her essay on Spanish music and the Spanish idiom, in a 2002 book on Spain in America, edited by Richard L. Kagan, already in the early 1800s, instruction in what was called Spanish guitar was being offered in Boston. And classical guitar concerts were given by one Senor Pucci in 1814. So already in the early 1800s, the concert guitar, the classical guitar is being identified as Spanish. And the reason for that was that there were uh, some outstanding guitar virtuosos from Spain who uh, not only performed, but also composed, including pedagogical works. So the Guitars Association with Spain would only increase in 19th century America, especially with the advent of a Spanish virtuoso uh, named uh, Trinidad Huerta uh, Icaturla in the 1820s. Huerta was a student of the renowned guitarist and composer Fernando Sor, uh, who was active throughout Europe, but did not come to the United States. Uh, Huerta arrived in New York on April 26, 1824. He gave concerts not only in New York City, but throughout the Northeast, including Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington. Huerta's friend and compatriot, Manuel Garcia Sr., disembarked with his opera company in New York in November 1825, as we now know. In fact, Garcia was himself a guitarist, and it was none other than Garcia who conducted the Parks Orchestra that performed at Trinidad Huerta's Farewell Benefit Concert at the City Hotel on January 2nd, 1826. So it, it's worth bearing in mind that musicians in the 19th century especially and their predecessors in earlier times were multifaceted. They were expected to be able to play uh, at least one instrument, probably two or three, to be able to sing, to be able to compose and to teach. In order to survive, you had to be multifaceted. So Huerta was but the first in a long line of Spanish guitarists, uh, performers and composers who would entertain and inspire audiences here including not only Miguel Llobet, but also, of course, Andre Segovia, and then some who even settled in the US, such as flamenco guitarists, uh, Carlos Montoya and Sabicas, and the versatile Romero uh, family of guitarists. So we truly envision this, this long tradition of Spanish artists, and we can see how in the moment that Garcias arrived in the United States, yeah. There have been also this, this um, musical influences from, from Spain already. Right. So we-, we um, Oh, I had some more, or am I stopping now? Yeah, so um, we're, we're going to go back to you, Walter, later on to speak about precisely this influence on Andres Segovia, on the Romeros that you've explored and that you've researched so much okay, in your fine. career. And we'll talk about this a bit later. But first of all, we've seen this context in which the Garcias appeared. We've seen this opening night. Now, Molly, tell us about this next month. So the Garcia's presence in the United States uh, stayed for, for months. And therefore, tell us a bit more about this, this experience uh, beyond the opening night. Okay. Well, over the next 10 months, the Garcias would present 79 performances of nine operas, but with only eight singers, Garcia could rehearse only one opera at a time. Four of those singers being family members, awkward casting resulted with father and daughter, mother and son, brother and sister enacting stage lovers. The, large, the hugely popular Barbier would provide most of the troops' momentum for the coming months. 
with um, what largely sustained its popularity, however, was the Signorina's brilliant idea of turning the lesson scene of Il Barbier into a virtual mini recital, thanks to her linguistic versatility, which enabled her to enthrall her adoring public with songs of all genres. On November 29 and 3 December 1825, she interpolated her father's Mahalito Nuevo, which was encored. Joseph, could we listen to Anna singing Mahalito Nuevo? Oh, lovely. The third night of Il Barbier, instead of Bajalita Nuevo in the lesson scene, Maria sang Home Sweet Home. The fourth night, she sang Bishop's uh, Ballad and Isha Walk in Silk Attire to her own piano accompaniment. When encored, she sang Home Sweet Home instead. In the weeks and months to come, Maria would sing three songs in the lesson scene. A Spanish song, a French song, usually Albert's Une Rose Bien Fleury from Emma, and an English, Scotch, or Irish ballad such as Couche la Macri. Joseph, could we listen to Anna singing Couche la Macri?
<laughs> could I could I just simply interrupt a little, just for a second, to really thank Anna and Isabel for these very special recordings, which I know at least one of them was made for this this event. So thank you, Anna and Isabel. It's a real honor to have you here uh, in uh, in both uh, in both ways as as artists and as panelists. So sorry to interrupt to have interrupted you, Molly. Oh no, that's all right. <laughs> <clears throat> Despite Maria's many charming interpolations, such as the beautiful one we just heard, when Rossini Silbarbier held the stage for the first five nights running, the three-month subscribers squawked. Garcia had no choice but to stall for time while readying the next opera for performance. This pattern would repeat six more times in seven months. Only by July 1826 was the troupe able to rotate its repertory on a regular basis. Garcia's ego made a dire situation worse. Instead of immediately following Il Barbier with another Rossini favorite, Garcia chose to premiere his own La Mante Astuto, The Cunning Lover, similar in plot to Il Barbier, but with spoken Italian dialogue and brutally difficult music intended to showcase his daughter Maria's astonishing da canto technique. Except for one crowd-pleasing arietta, A per pietà cedere, which we'll hear from Anna uh, in a few moments, to assuage the public's disappointment, Garcia followed with two more acclaimed Rossini operas, Tancredi, with Rossini's happy conclusion and the signorina fetchingly attired as the young Syracusan king provoked an instant uptick in opera attendance. Tancredi became the second most popular opera after Il Barbier. As Giuseppe Pasta gushed enthusiastically to his wife back in Paris, the Italian theater in New York is going great guns. The Americans are extremely interested in sustaining this venture. In February 1826, the troupe introduced its first tragedy, Rossini's Otello, with Maria as the doomed heroine Desdemona. In this opera, Maria came into her own as a superb actress, deadly earnest in counteracting the Park Theater's low standards of their similitude. After the first performance of Otello, she refused to sing the Willow Song, holding a fake Papier Machet's harp, while Denise Germain Etienne accompanied her on the piano. She pronounced the pop ridiculous and threw herself into learning to play a real harp. Marie's star quality was essential to the troupe's success. Little wonder the heart stopping news in March 1826 that the signorina was to marry a Mr. Malibran and retire from the stage in six months caused universal consternation. One week after witnessing Maria's church nuptials, Dominic Lindes chaired a meeting at New York City Hotel to raise money to build an opera house and retain Manuel Garcia Sr. to run it. Stockholders would capitalize a legal entity called the New York Opera Company. But in 1826, too few sufficiently wealthy and socially ambitious people were willing to assume that kind of risk. The troops soldiered on through dark times caused by two failures. When Garcia cast Rossini's Il Turco in Italia without the signorina, it played to empty seats. Further exacerbated, the public pronounced an utter fiasco Garcia's own grand spectacle, La Filia dell'Aria o Semiramide, with its nonsensical plot, cacophonous music, and male duets sung on horseback. Fortunately, with Lorenzo de Ponte's moral support, Garcia overcame Park Theater manager Edmund Simpson's resistance to the added expense to produce Don Giovanni. Mozart's chef d'oeuvre became the highlight of the troupe's engagement. By spring 1826, the Italian opera in New York enjoyed its pinnacle of popularity. Fine weather brought an influx of tourists determined to savor their first taste of Italian opera. As of late July, having added to its repertory two hit operas based on familiar stories, Rossini's La Cenerentola and Zingarelli's Romeo e Giulietta, the troupe hit its stride, offering a different opera every night to packed houses. Then, seemingly suddenly, Manuel Garcia 
announced his intention to leave New York from Mexico in the fall of 1826. That long dreaded news inspired a vociferous public campaign to renew the troops engagement. But manager Simpson stood fast. An Italian opera company could no longer exist with his English speaking thespian company in the same theater. On September 30, the, the troupe gave its last performance, Il Barbier, in an atmosphere charged with emotion. As the last strains of the incomparable Garcia family died away, the audience rose en masse to again demand a re-engagement, but it was too late. The Garcias, without Maria, of course, would embark for Veracruz on October 16, 1826. While enthusiasm for Italian opera in New York had waxed and waned in unpredictable ways, the troupe had endured an astonishing 306 days. By contrast, the Italian Opera Company of 1833 would fold after only 63 days. Dominic Lynch was not in New York to witness his troupe's final victory lapse. He was in London with James Fenimore Cooper sitting side by side, listening to Judita Pasta sings Elmira and comparing her to the signorina, Lynch may have come to the sudden realization that had his divinity, Judita, said yes to coming to America, his bold and most costly experiment could have died aborting. Judita Pasta would ultimately star in 60 Italian operas, but she never sang Rosina in Il Barbier de Sevilla. The role simply did not suit her. Moreover, Pasta sang only in Italian. Meanwhile, back in New York, after her family's departure, Maria embraced her new role as a New York society matron, but her life of leisure was short-lived. Her husband's looming, previously undivulged insolvency forced her to return to the stage and concert room. Thousands of dollars earned singing English ballad operas during two sold out engagements at the new Bowery Theater and public concerts in New York City and Philadelphia failed to satisfy her husband's crippling debts. The couple decided Maria should return to Europe to pursue the highly remunerative, remunerative singing career for which she was destined. Just as Dominic Lynch had foretold, as Madame Malibran Garcia, New York senior in it would become the prima donna of Europe. She left behind in New York a legacy of vocal brilliance to which every new singer making her debut in New York would be compared for decades to come. During those same decades, New Yorkers would puff with pride for having had the discernment to recognize her genius and to catapult her to stardom. Definitely, she would become that prima donna. And I, I found fascinating several points that you mentioned. One of them was, uh, of course, how this long lasting period in which the, the Garcias uh, stayed in New York was full of great successes, but also it had some shadows to it, as any artistic uh, endeavor may have. But at the same time, I think there was something very interesting, which was the intelligence of the Garcia family to appeal to New York City audiences. And I would like to talk to you, Anna, a little bit more about this point, because soon both Manuel Garcia and his daughter Maria became New York City favorites. So from a performance point of view, as a fantastic performer as you are, so how do you think that the Garcias, and particularly, let's say, Maria Maligran, adapted to New York City tastes at the time? Okay, so uh, using some of uh, Molly's uh, excellent research, and uh, I, I learned that New York City audiences in this 1825 to around 1827 period were already acquainted with uh, Rossini's music through um, music publications, although reviews of the time do state that the, in that period a test uh, of the public's strong dislike for over florid singing. So Maria Felicia was the only English speaker uh, in this group, and she quickly pivoted, uh, as Molly said, to uh, English ballads. So she sang Irish and English ballads, which were in favor at the time, not only in America, but very much in England. Uh, and she favored uh, songs from the, the famous Thomas Cook collection of Irish melodies. So I would like to have, uh, uh, I like to display uh, uh, a friend's piece of, uh, of a song that she became known for. Yes, so this list is a list compiled by Molly 
of uh, edited songs in New York City during the time of the Garcias um, that carried uh, the inscription as sung by Senorina, uh, Senorina Garcia, as sung by Senor Garcia, and as sung by Madame Garcia, the mother, Joanna Stiches. So this gives an indication of a flurry of, uh, of music publishers that were running to, to make some money <laughs> uh, based on the popularity um, uh, of the Garcias and the music that they were uh, that they were singing and performing in New York City at the time. And I also wanted to show this very nice uh, lithograph of one of the pieces called "The Light Guitar" by John Barnett. And it's it's a really beautiful lithograph. And as you can see, it says as sung by. Signorina, Rossi, uh, Signorina Garcia. I keep seeing Signorina Rossini. It's Signorina Garcia um, to accompany this, this music publication that was bought by, by New Yorkers that would go and hear her sing. And now I'd like to play a very short excerpt of this same song, The Light Guitar. So I think we can get this idea of uh, what it meant to sung by Señorina García and all these songs that were yeah, inspired it's just to give a taste by Maria Maribra. Absolutely. Yeah, to give and a taste of what, what this music sounded like and what they yeah. what people liked at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think this is this is extraordinary and it's truly interesting to see this influence of uh, Maria Maribran and seeing how these pieces actually were edited, seeing a song by Maria Maribran and a song by Manuel Garcia. Now I would like to talk about another piece, which is the aria Aper Pietà Cedete from Manuel Garcia's opera, La Mante Astuto. And I would really like to thank Professor Radomsky's generosity on this because uh, we would like to thank him that he made possible that we we got to to access this this course and also his support and guidance to to this panel too so let's let's talk a bit more about this area in particular which was pretty successful at, at the time Can you tell us a bit more anna Okay, so Professor Radomsky is the undisputed expert on the figure of Manuel Garcia, and he believes in that the artistic and musical value of Garcia's opera, La Mante Astuto, has been sadly overlooked. Uh, the opera itself was poorly received in New York City, although very well received in Mexico, as it had a huge amount of spoken dialogue in Italian, like Molly said, but the aria, Ace de te per pietà, received a glowing review, and this review is what prompted uh, Molly to ask Professor Radomsky to edit the aria, especially for this academic meeting, so I could learn it and 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 do this recording to to exhibit. And I do want to um, before we play the aria, I'll, 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 I wanted to share this glowing review that inspired us to to include this uh, in in this meeting. For ourselves, shall we frankly confess it, we were incomparably more affected by the air in the ninth scene, as sung by Signorina Ros Garcia, a per pietà cedete, than by anything of the same kind we recollect 
ever to have heard. The melody itself seems to be the very language of the tenderest entreaty, and nothing can be imagined more irresistibly touching than the powerful pathos with which it was sung. The humble attitude, low at her father's feet, the earnest and desperate clinging to her father's cloak, the upward look of the innocent supplication, as long as there is hope. And if we can listen to the aria now, that would be wonderful. Oh, that's the wrong one. Bravissima, Anna. 
Beautiful, beautiful. So now we're going to move to another espresso. So this was the first surprise, this Aria, which is a world premiere recording. Now we're going to move to another world premiere recording. Uh, I'm extremely excited about this one, not only because I play on, on this the Mandavu, but also because uh, this, this piece came to us thanks to Molly's fantastic research, formidable research. And uh, it shows another side of the Garcia's performances mm -hmm. in Europe, particularly, I would say, Maria Maribran. Could you tell us a bit more about in which kind of settings would Maria Maribran compose and perform this piece that we're going to hear now, this Tufmanda move? Well, when we started thinking about this panel, of course, it's well documented the operas that that uh, that that Maria sang, right? Uh, I I I I wasn't particularly interested in reprising these Rossini arias, which are so famous, you know, Tancredi and and Barbieri and all of those things. But what came to mind was a question that I asked Molly as to like, well, what, what did she sing off stage? What did Sing at the dinner parties? What did she sing at the soirees? And that's what got us going on this, which for 19th century performers, uh, opera performers, uh, this, this whole salon culture was extremely important. That's how careers were made was, was in the salons and, uh, and, and, and this activity done at, at people's private homes where there were very important people involved that actually moved um, you know, the important moves that, that would make or break a career. So this whole soiree activity of what she sang, what were her party songs, uh, which was, prompt, you know, prompted us to look at, 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 at these, you know, songs that she sang off stage. So um, this Turmonda Moor falls under that category. And the context of the song is one of sincere friendship from Maria Felicia towards her friend and patron, Madame Antoinette Brugier, the matriarch of a French immigrant family, a very high success, successfully high merchant family in New York City at the time, and in the tradition of uh, gestures of friendship within the 19th century context from artists to friends and patrons, uh, things such as original poems, watercolors, and of course, musical compositions were given as symbolic gifts of appreciation and friendship. And in this case, the song that we're about to hear, Tourmont d'Amour, published in New York City and bears a dedication to Madame Brugier. And this song also is an important evidence of salon culture and patronage of early 19th century New York. Okay, so let's listen to this beautiful song. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So um, we've seen how the Garcias influenced the culture, the U.S. culture. We've seen how uh, the Garcias influenced the performance at the time. Now we're going to talk about another part, a very important part uh, in music, which is musical pedagogy. And they were also extremely influential 
on this regard. And I would like to, to ask uh, Patricia precisely about this. So Patricia, could you tell us a bit more about the Garcia's technique? What were its key features? What are its key features? And uh, yeah, how can we identify the Garcia's technique? Yeah. Then uh, one of the legacies of the Garcia family in America is undoubtedly the arrival and gradual implantation of the Garcia vocal technique, which is a seed that will be a fruit in the long term. Malibran's virtuosity and very expressive singing greatly impact the audiences during her visit to New York. And this one of, was one of the spearheads of the prestige that Garcia Singing School acquired in America throughout the 19th century. Let us review some key features of this Garcia vocal technique, always keeping in mind that each singing pedagogue will emphasize different aspects to their pupils. For example, those aspects that were more difficult to attain for him or for her, and therefore have more consciousness in their teaching, or those features that solve specific problems related to the mainstream repertoire of each epoch. So some of Manuel Garcia Sr.'s contributions to his own technique were the centrality of the psychology of the singer and the emphasis on self-confidence, the creativity and improvisation as resources that should be inherent to vocal technique so that the singer could modify the musical text in the performative context a voice that should achieve both agility and strength and not sacrifice one for the other, and the incorporation of pathos in the performance and a very wide vocal range, both features that astounded audiences and music critics alike. For his part, his son, Manuel Patricio Garcia, worked on the systematization of the method and strongly felt the need to understand the functioning of the human voice with an empirical basis. So even though he was not really the only one to invent the laryngoscope, because there were other scientists working on it, he was indeed the first one to use it from the inside of the singing profession. For the singing pedagogy, it was probably the most significant contribution as an applied scientific device, because it allows us to see the behavior of the vocal folds while speaking or singing. So science entered the vocal technique, and this meant the possibility to relate our own sensations as singers with physiological processes. But beyond technical details or different pedagogical approaches, the key feature about Garcia Singing School is that it will be configured over time as a factor of self-identification, an emblem of quality, a trademark that grants prestige. Because the adherence to the Garcia vocal technique symbolizes the connection with an ancestral and revered musical past of the great composers of the 18th and 17th centuries and with the great singers of this romantic past, such as Garcia himself, the Malibran, and later Jenny Lind, Julius Stockhausen, Pauline Viardot, and many others. Because these were never recorded, not even in their old age. We will never know how their singing sounded, but it's clear that their performances aroused so much passion and interest in audiences, that audiences traveled great distances to attend. A romantic myth was developed both in Europe and in America about certain members of the Garcia family, especially Manuel Garcia Sr. and Malibran. And this myth shows certain analogies with that of Liszt and Paganini, not only because their performances seem to be able to challenge and transcend the limit of the human voice regarding technical difficulties, but because in the context of romanticism, they incorporated pathos as an intrinsic element of performance practice. 
Garcia's technique was able to adapt and evolve to accompany the new vocal demands of the changing operatic and other vocal styles without losing the core of its origin, which was the Italian bel canto. In the second half of the, of the 19th century, many of the Garcia school singers were successful Wagnerian performers or art songs of the Brahms circle and therefore were associated with composers who made it into the canon of Western classical music and became part of this mythical conglomerate. And this in turn evolved in new generations of singing teachers whose vocal technique built a symbolic bridge between that admired past and the present in which the aspiring singers studied and worked. So sometimes these singers studied for several years with teachers from the Garcia singing school. And sometimes it was only a brief but very fruitful, fruitful relationship. Ma Manuel Garcia Sr. himself had not favored long term apprenticeships with him. However, the fact that these singers emphasized that they had studied with Garcia school teachers demonstrates again the prestige that the brand Garcia carried in an artistic or pedagogical career. So, Patricia, can we perhaps trace a book or genealogy of exponents of this technique? Yeah, sure. So, indeed, let's have a look at the first slide, please, Joseph. Manuel Garcia Sr. taught many students, among which, of course, Manuel Garcia Jr. and Maria Garcia, later Malibran, Pauline Garcia, later Viardo, was only 11 years old when her father died. So even though she was a pianist of her father's lessons and must have absorbed much of his teaching, her actual adult singing training was a result of the joint work of Manuel Garcia Jr., Joaquin Abriones, teacher, her mother, and Adolf Nuri. Uh, the next slide is a letter by Manuel Garcia to her, his sister Vialdo, a much later uh, letter. And Manuel Garcia Jr. devoted himself to vocal pedagogy after a very short singing career. And some decades later, Pauline Viardot began her own teaching, focusing mainly on women's voices. Some of their letters, as this one, show Manuel Garcia's answers to Pauline Viardot's queries regarding specific vocal technique problems of her students. Let's have a look at the next slide. What we could name the third generation of the Garcia Singing School, that is to say singers and pedagogues trained by either Manuel Garcia Jr., Pauline Viardot, or both of them, are many, but I have selected those who have had an impact on American singers and singing teachers. These are Matilde Marchesi, Julius Stockhausen, Lili Lehmann, Anna Schoenrene, Marianne Brandt, and Aglaia Orgeni. All these are shown in yellow. During most of the 19th century, most American singers that wanted to be trained in Garcia's vocal technique traveled to Europe to study either with Manuel Garcia Jr., Pauline Viardot, or this th uh, third generation of Garcia voice teachers. To name a few of these American singers, Antoinette Sterling Contralto studied with Manuel Garcia Jr. and Pauline Viardot and had a very successful career in Britain. Clarence Whitehill, Putnam Griswold, and Anton Van Roy studied with Stockhausen, and all of them were renowned Wagnerian singers at the Met. Both Madis Doza and Suzanne Adams studied with Marchesi and were major stars later. Geraldine Farrar studied with Lily Lehmann, and she sang at the Met with Caruso. But there were also teachers of European origin who emigrated to America to sing or to teach the Garcia vocal technique. For example, Anna Schoenrené was a German-born singer who studied with Viardot. 
Her singing career was cut short because of bad health, but she emigrated to America and established herself as a vocal pedagogue in Minnesota and later in New York, where she joined the faculty of the Juilliard School of Music. As the next slide shows, she was a certified Garcia Technique singing teacher. Could we see? Yeah. And taught American singers such as Margaret Harsha, Reese Stevens, and George Miller, whom Jean Rene took to Paris with her so that Fierdot could supervise the, te the teaching process. Another emigrated to America was Ernestine Schumann that also studied with Viardot and performed with Gustav Mahler. Afterward, she continued her singing career in America and became an American citizen. And Hermina Rudersdorf, also a German born, studied under Lili Lehmann and established herself later in Boston as a very much sought after vocal pedagogue. The American singers and teachers of the Garcia technique mark, mark the definitive rooting of the school. To name a few, uh, Blanche Thibon, who was a mezzo, studied with Edith Walker, a student of Marianne Brandt, and uh, George Miller and Lillian Blauvelt studied with Jean René, and Miller had an international career that included role creations by Richard Strauss and many seasons at the Met, but afterward he turned into musical theater. So it's very interesting to see how the Garcia technique was able to adapt to other musical traditions. And Alan Lindquist was an American tenor researcher and teacher of many singers that are still active today. So we can see this lasting influence. We can see that the influence of the Garcia appears at Juilliard, appears at the musical theater, appears even with Meryl Streep and John Crawford also. We can trace this influence to these Oscar winning actresses. So it truly uh, encompassed various genres and very different uh, performance activities, let's say. So not only musical, but also in acting. So quite, quite fascinating. Now, Many of those who kept the legacy of the Garcia's life actually were women, particularly singing teachers. We've just seen this, this great list of singers and most of them were women. And we have to remind ourselves how the women of the Garcia family had been a great example of women with extraordinary careers who attained economic independence through their work. Patricia, which role do you think vocal performance and pedagogy played in the empowerment of women in the 19th century, particularly in the US? Yes, indeed, both the professions of singer and singing teacher were a means of economic independence for many women in the 19th century. Of course, it was easier to enter the operatic profession if you came already from a, from a family that was already in the business, as was the case with the daughters of Manuela Joaquina Garcia. But it was very different in the case, for example, of Anna Schoenrené, who remembered her parents saying, what will people say when she told them she wanted to be a singer? However, in the Garcia family, in which the musical profession was taken for granted, a difference can be traced between the low profiles of, of uh, uh, Joaquina Briones Sitges in the early 19th century and the high profile shown by both Malibran and Pauline Viardot. Both sisters established themselves as bench benchmarks of successful uh, professional and independent women capable of managing the monetary aspect of their profession and, in the case of Yardo, of carrying out professional recyclings in her middle age. Teaching the know-how of the singing profession and establishing professional networking was also part of the training. Manuel Garcia Sr. had been himself an entrepreneur and this ability he passes on to his children who absorb this entrepreneurial aspect of the profession. This is not something innate to singer or singing teachers, of course, and especially in women, it was very much frowned upon due to the taboo of handling money or 
of knowing how to discuss a cachet. We could say that one of the trademarks of the Garcia family, in addition to vocal technique, is knowing how to defend oneself in the professional world. And judging by, by Manuel Garcia Jr. and Viardot's letters to their students, and from Viardot to impresarios of the time, it is clear that this dimension was an intrinsic part of the learning relationship. Um, many American female singers, can we see the next image, please? Trained by the Garcia School, thanks, achieved a high professional level, singing re leading roles and earning their living through singing, as for example, Adelaide Phillips, who was an Anglo-American singer and student of Manuel Garcia Jr. She had an international career that spanned between Europe and America, both in opera, oratory, and comic opera, operas by Gilbert and Sullivan. Sophie Traumann, who was a soprano, studied with Viardot and sang at the Met for 10 seasons. Maud Fay studied with Aglaya Orgeni and had a very successful career, singing mostly Wagnerian and roles by Strauss, both in Europe and America. Edith Walker studied with Aglaya Orgeni too, but also with Marianne Brandt and sang mostly Wagnerian roles in European opera houses and also in the Met, when, where she sang with Caruso too. Risa Stevens studied with Anna Jean René and had a spanning international singing career. And we could also name Ada Adine, Geraldine Farrar, Margaret Harsha, the list could go on and on. But for many American women of, of the um, 19th and early 20th century, the Garcia Vocal School also provided an important and in some cases socially acceptable means of earning a living as singing pedagogues. This is especially significant for, for these women not only established their own private studios, but often made it into very prestigious musical institutions. For some of them, the pedagogical career was even longer than the singing. This is the case of the already mentioned Anna Jean René, who taught at Juilliard, Julia Eta Crane, who studied with Manuel Garcia and afterward set up her own Crane Normal Institute of Music, whose aim was to train public school music teachers, or Esther Liebling, soprano who studied with Matilde Marchesi and began her teaching during her singing career. But she was afterward a very much sought after voice teacher and vocal coach and author of books on vocal technique, but also on performer practice. Her most a famous disciple was, of course, Beverly Seals, but she also coached, as you said, actors and actresses such as Oscar winners Meryl Streep and John Crawford. For others, teaching positions arrived during or after their last years of active singing, like Margaret Harsha, who taught at Curtis and Indiana, Edith Walker, who after retiring established her own private studio. Sophie Traumann, who after retiring was a vocal teacher at the Old Met, or Lucia Durnham, who studied with Lily Lehman and taught per vocal performance at uh, Juilliard and was also a founding members, member of Nats. So while the female members of the Garcia family were strong ref reference of professional and independent women, the Garcia vocal technique proved to be a relevant device to achieve this empowerment. So we can see this lasting influence, this extraordinary influence of the family Garcia, of the Garcia family how this family of artists influenced the music scene in the United States, the pedagogic methods, the performance practice. So to conclude this panel, I would like to ask Walter about this lasting influence nowadays. So when we see all these Spanish artists, we're all presenting ourselves in the US, um, how do you think we can trace this influence? You spoke before about Andres Segovia and the Romeros. How can we trace this influence from the Garcias to nowadays or to the last decades? 
Well, there are a number of things that can be said, um, but uh, let me just say that Garcia played a major role in inaugurating an enduring love affair in the Americas with Italian opera in particular. It's too easy to forget now that the American premiere of Puccini's La Boheme actually took place in Los Angeles in 1897. But more importantly, perhaps, was the fact that he proved that ordinary Spaniards were not, as John Quincy Adams thought, a, quote, lazy, dirty, nasty parcel of hogs, unquote. Spain was capable of high culture and had much to offer in this regard, in terms not only of performance, but also composition and pedagogy, as we've just learned. It was not isolated from, but rather connected to modern European civilization. So Garcia thus helped pave the way for close cultural connections between the US and Spain, which as I observed earlier, flourished not just in spite of the 1898 war, but apparently as a result of it. It was a flood tide of Spanish singers, conductors, pianists, and guitarists who would command attention on US stages, along with Spanish authors, uh, Garcia Lorca, who spent time in New York City, Vicente Blasco Ibanez, whose novels became the stuff of Hollywood legend, especially my favorite, Blood and Sand. And the beat goes on until fairly recently, the now disgraced, unfortunately, Placido Domingo, made a mark as a singer, conductor, and artistic director, especially in Los Angeles, where he starred in productions of Torroba's Luisa Fernanda, and Peneas El Gato Montes, and uh, major Spanish composers like Carles Surinac and uh, Leonardo Ballada also settled and prospered in the US on the East Coast. But speaking of Hollywood, the films of uh, Pedro Almodovar are perennial favorites here, and actors like Antonio Banderas and uh, Penelope Cruz are justly celebrated. And what I've discovered in my research on Joaquin Rodrigo is that the adagio movement from his Concierto de Aranjuez for guitar and orchestra has appeared in several movies and television commercials. Of course, the impact of US culture on Spain is also conspicuous, but that's a topic for another day. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists to really embark us into this journey to the 1820s, to the Garcia's family influence in the United States, and also to this lasting legacy of the Garcia's. Now I would like to open the floor for any questions that you may have, the audience may have. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Let me thank, let me thank you, all of you for take, taking us along this fascinating journey and showing us all the different connections and the different spheres that this important family uh, uh, touched on. And uh, so if there are, are there any questions? Uh, I could I just, rem could I just remind, uh, 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 inform you that in case you don't know, connecting with uh, Walter's first, um, uh, first uh, interven intervention, that we, we actually published a study on uh, Granados and Quinito Valverde in, uh, in, in the US. Uh, in, it's, it's an issue of uh, Studios del Observatorio. And we had a talk by, uh, by Richard Kagan a few months ago talking about Spanish craze. So everything comes together here. Everything. I, I also want to. I also want to say that in May at the Hispanic Society, we're going to present small excerpts of the Quinito, uh, uh -huh. of the Quinito music. We're going to end our music in the time of Soroya, bringing it back to New York by presenting part of this revista. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. So. sorry, sorry. Thank, you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. So Joe said you were going to say something. Yeah, I have a question. So um, Patricia had mentioned that one of the hallmarks of Garcia's technique was to promote creativity and just like encourage improvisation. And I was wondering like when performing these pieces, um, you, you mentioned that they were as sung. And so I was wondering like, does that creativity and improvisation come through um, when, when reading the notations of, in, in the music? Well, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, Manuel Garcia Sr. was a, uh, uh, referring to the repertoire he was most involved with, and he was most involved, in, involved with Bel Canto and Rossini. And uh, 
so it, it's a, a kind of perf uh, performance and uh, a musical text to say it that uh, allows lots of improvisation and so uh, when he was um, he when he was not very in very good form in very good vocal form uh, he was able to change one uh, um, one, on, one ornamentation for other he was referring to that but of course afterward during the 19th century the both the art song and the, the opera evolved or changed to a more um stabilized music text that didn't allow so much improvisation so that was not uh, so much possible because you couldn't change uh, Wagner uh, music, especially if Wagner was in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the audience? I don't know if this is positive. I know general uh, comparisons are always difficult, but could I ask any of you, who would Maria Malibran compare to compared to, uh, who could she be compared to in today's, among today's uh, sopranos or mezzo-sopranos <laughs> in terms of voice or, or I don't know, or, or well, register it's, it's, or it's, register. It's no secret that um, that Carla um, very much appreciated Malibran and, and paid a, a visit to her grave because some of the, the um, how, Malibran's voice was was described was actually very close to the kind of descriptions that Kalas was described as. But also, this it's no should be no surprise that um, that Cecilia Bartoli has a, a huge passion for Maria Malibran. Had mounted her own museum it, like a bookmobile, like it was a mobile museum of all the artifacts, and um, and she did a whole CD dedicated to Malibran's repertoire. I can see how the personality of Malabran really captivated like uh, 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 Cecilia Bartoli's, Maestra Bartoli's personalities and, and, and proclivities. Mm -hmm. So you know, probably mm -hmm. today the closest one would be um, would be Miss Bar Ms. Bartoli. Although in the way the voice is described, it's like a soprano sfogata. Uh -huh. It's towards Callas because mm -hmm. um, Malabran was a lyric metaphor in which through the extension of her father's technique did soprano range. Mm -hmm. So it created a special effect probably in her voice. It created like, you know, a special Malabran spectacular effect that this mm -hmm. lyric mezzo then could sing soprano re repertoire with part of mm -hmm. her spectacularity, so to say, to, to say it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was a question from Rose. Yeah, Rose, sorry, maybe I interrupted you. Yeah, so go ahead. Yes. I, want to make, I want to make a statement. Um, I studied voice with a teacher way back in 1967, and she was in her 70s, and she sounded like a young woman. And she told me that she had studied with the Garcia technique, which I think is very interesting because I am now 81 and I can still sing and sound like a young person. Yeah. So I remember from her teaching, the, the most two most important exercises were staccato and runs. And I think that those two would do what Anatona said, take a, a mezzo and extend the range because with her, I wound up singing a high F. And, and it was just this extension of using soprano, I mean, staccato and runs, which I still do teach. And I really firmly believe it's how to keep your technique mobile and how to keep it young. And I think it's one of the basics of the Garcia technique. So that's just my, my little... <laughs> So I have a slight connection somehow. Wow, thank you for that contribution. Very special. Would anybody so like to comment on this? No? 
So maybe just one well, last We should question. add you to the next yeah. presentation we do on the Garcia's family. You're part of that genealogy. So definitely yeah. <laughs> you, you included. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. You're welcome. Yes, I should include you on, on you. the with yeah. the photographs. <laughs> and just one question for Molly and Walter. Did the Garcia family have an impact impact in, in composition? In in the composition of music and uh you know, a repertoire. Mm. Ah, well, from a piano performance, I'm sorry I jumped here, right, but I want to yeah. uh, include the piano in this panel too as a pianist. And uh, it's very interesting because we find this genre of the potpourri or reminiscence or fantasies on opera themes. That was mm -hmm. very typical. That was very uh, common in the 19th century. And many composers like Marshalls, Hummel, etc., would do these fantasies on Maria Malibran's or operas that Maria Malibran would sing and actually would mm -hmm. mention Maria Malibran within that. So that was a very popular genre. Uh, we have to think that all these themes were very popular among the audiences. So they all knew how, how they went and, and they wanted to hear that also in piano transcriptions. So many composers at the time would include these opera references and many of them included specifically Maria Malibran as sung by Maria Malibran as we were mm -hmm. saying before or, uh, or even they were dedicated this, this works to her. So they also had an impact on piano composition. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Anna. I wanted to say that a friend of mine saw on Facebook that this presentation was taking place, and he uh, gave me an excerpt of of, of a Sarasate piece that's based on Bahia Nuevo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can finish here. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank you. Uh, thank. I'd like to thank the audience uh, for, for, for sharing this, uh, this time with us. I think it's very, been a really special event, like all those that Isabel suggests to, to, to us. And thank you, uh, Walter and Molly and Patricia and Anna for, for accepting to, to, to participate, to, to, to form up this really uh, uh, brilliant panel uh, with this, uh, very new topic for us. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much, Anna and, and Isabel, for your performances, which have made it yes. really very, very special indeed. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is a very rich period, and it's sometimes overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as if it's something that sort of happened in between, you know, Mozart and Wagner, but no, this is a very mm -hmm. rich period and in the musical life of the United States. And thank you all for shedding so much light on. Thank you. Thank you.